Hi, I'm Katie Russell from Ivo Energy and I'm here to talk to you about a problem that I'm personally really interested in, um, which is the problem of energy disaggregation. I will define it as I talk. Um, and a question that I asked myself as I was thinking about what to say to you here today, which is, does that problem represent a lot of elements of artificial intelligence more generally? Um, and indeed, through talking about that problem, can I share with you some of my experience about building machine learning products? So yeah, I'm hoping you'll come away. Hello to the new John. I'm just going to pause for a minute, let you come in and sit down. So I'm hoping you'll come away a bit inspired about a true story of a problem that's come from research all the way to a commercial product valued by customers. I'm hoping you'll nod along if you yourselves are working on either products or problems powered by AI. Um, and maybe you'll learn something new about the energy industry as well. As a brief intro to me, um, I've just checked with George and I'm now in my 10th year of <laughs> having completed my PhD, so still qualify as new to OR. <laughs> um, and let's see, around the time I graduated from my PhD, which was in mathematical physics, um, it wasn't a good time to go into finance, which probably would have been what I'd gone into. Um, and by chance, I think I stumbled on an interesting startup working in the utilities space. In, in that case, it was a problem of kind of more revenue assurance, but the aspects of water and energy consumption and how that can tie back to people and human behaviour really kind of struck a chord with me, and so I've stayed in utilities ever since, and now I'm at Ovo Energy. I'm not going to give you a sales pitch on Ovo Energy, but I will just set some context for you on the energy market, because if I don't set the context on the wider energy market, then the actual technical problem I'm going to talk to you about won't make any sense. Um, for this audience, I don't need to gauge graph literacy or things like that, but let me just ask a few questions, if you don't mind playing along, to find out how much you know about energy, maybe. So, who in the room is responsible for sorting out your payments to your electricity or gas supplier, things like that at home. Okay, that's a good number. I was expecting less. I'm not going to tell you who they are. <laughs> no, that's all right. Well, um, the big six energy suppliers still have um, a huge market share, 75%. Um, and so I'll tell you the story of an independent energy company. But I would think that those of you who do manage it, the vast majority of you are with one of the big six. You know, SSE, British Gas, Empower. It's embarrassing for me to tell you who it is, can you? <laughs> it's going to be all right. I'll think of a plan. No, that's all right, but you might save some money. Oh, um, you are my supplier. Oh, yay! Cool. Oh, <laughs> you might be able to give me some feedback. So, yeah, a little bit about Ovo Energy then. Um, competition was introduced into the retail energy market back in 1999. So, from those of you like who might not be familiar with the UK energy market, here in the UK we have a choice about who supplies our energy, hence my question. It's not just geographically based. Um, and the market is split, so we've got generators of energy, we've got people distributing the energy, and then we've got people like Ovo who are selling the energy to customers. Um, Ovo was launched 10 years ago um, and is now the largest independent supplier, but still with only 5% market share. So even that growth, as you see, like 1.5 million customers now, that still only represents 5% market share. Um, we are... I mean, you don't need to see all the kind of awards and so on. I think what I want you to take away from this slide is more that we're quite a technology-first company. Um, we've just been valued at one billion, so we're officially like a tech unicorn, which is very nice. Um, and also, I think from an OR perspective, you might be interested in some of the problems that we solve with the team at OVO. So we have our own in-house customer service centre, and it was always one of the values that we really tried to promote as a differentiating factor, like why would you choose to come to us? You would come to us because of our customer service. How do we keep that customer service good? It's a massive optimization problem because we've got limited call centers, we've got you know, call center staff, we've got people phoning, so we want to be able to forecast the call demand, optimize for the constraints we have, like the number of agents, the fact they need a break, um, and make sure that the right people are on the right phones at the right time. We also invested really heavily in the smart meter rollout, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that because the smart meters give us the data that's needed for the problems we're solving. Um, but again, another OR problem comes into play there because we didn't want to rely on external suppliers to actually install the smart meters for us. So we set about building a team of electrical engineers who could be deployed to install smart meters in customers' homes. There's another lovely OR problem, the routing of the van, making sure they've got the right equipment, and so on. 
And then, yeah, I mentioned innovation. We're a company that's looking to offer customers a choice, and so we need to offer them something innovative, something more than just, we sell you energy, but possibly even, we help you save energy. We help you spend less with us and more products. So we're developing data-driven products for customers that really innovate for them. Um, yeah, smart meters. So just in fact, some figures for you. Um, we've been, this is as part of the big data part of the, the talk, right? We've installed over one million individual smart meters to date. Does anyone have a smart meter? Oh, nice, okay. How are you getting on with it? Did you? You probably got like a device when it was installed in them. Yeah, And it's in your drawer. We're really lobbying for that. Um, yeah, so with one million individual smart meters that have been installed, they're, um, they're actually taking a reading of your energy supply um, in your home every half hour. So we've got 48 readings per day, one million smart meters, the data grows really big. And with that data growth, we get the opportunities for customer innovation. Um, we did have nearly 50% of our customer base with smart meters, but we've been helping out a number of failed suppliers recently by taking on their customers. and so. The number's gone down a little bit. Um, but yeah, as of the time of writing, we were the number one supplier for the smart rollout. But to kind of zoom back a little bit and talk a bit about why, to, to help you care about the problem as much as I do, um, the reason why we're rolling out smart meters is because, it, well, one, it's been mandated to us, but the reason for the mandate has come from the EU, um, and that's come as a way to reduce carbon emissions. If we can reduce energy usage, we can reduce carbon emissions. And there's a clear link between the massive rise in global temperature and carbon dioxide. In term, this is the last kind of slide on OVO, because I do want to move on to the technical problems. I'm just still trying to set the scene a little. Um, in terms of why smart metering, why are we doing it, and what are we doing about that wider demand problem of climate change, I think it's really interesting. Um, Customers have always told us they want cheaper energy, they want it greener, and they want it available when they need it. Uh, you could, for example, be on a tariff where it's cheaper at certain times of day, and we could ask you to run your washing machine or use your dishwasher at different times of day, and then you'll get cheaper energy. But asking that of the customer isn't necessarily the best way to solve the problem long term. And so what we're working on is solving the problem of demand more from the outer edges of the network in. What I mean by that is electricity is expensive because everyone wants to use it at peak times. And if we can shift that demand, that would be one way of solving the problem, like ask people to use it at a different time. Or we could store the energy and then it's available for use whenever. You can get the energy when it's cheap and then with storage, use it whenever you like. The thing is, storage is also really expensive, and it's coming down in cost. What we're doing, instead of a large centralised storage system, is we have a hypothesis that if we could decentralise storage, have it in every customer's home, like a battery, for example, then the energy is there where it's needed. In times when it's not acting as a kind of arbitrage opportunity, it can also be used to help balance the grid using frequency response. Batteries, as I said, are still expensive. But if you look at things like trends towards growth of electric cars, electric cars are really just a big moving battery. And so while it's not serving the purpose of being a car and is parked on your drive at home, it could be making you some money too. So that's one of the problems we're working on. It's a problem of grid optimization, again, balancing lots of constraints, making revenue for the customers. And ultimately, that could mean that we could offer electricity much cheaper. So that means we need to deploy smart meters, because if we don't know what's happening in the homes at the edges of the grid, we need a smart meter. To offer customers smart meters, we need to give them a reason to want one, and giving every customer that pitch about the energy storage solutions and the batteries and the electric vehicles is probably too much of an ask. So we give them something that's valuable to them immediately, and we tell them a little bit more about their electricity usage. Where is their electricity spend going? How much are they spending on their heating and what could they do to save money? 
So I've come back to full circle to the problem that I was talking about at the beginning, which is how can we build data products for customers that help them save money on their energy usage. And that's the story of energy disaggregation. It started out with a discovery in 1992 with George W. Hart, um, who was working with a research institute in the US with some sensor data. The electricity usage just in his home. And what he noticed when the electricity usage was being recorded at a very granular level, every few seconds, he noticed that he could really clearly see the refrigerator, for example, as compared to the oven. He could see the cycling, the power draw of those different appliances, and they each had their own unique signature. He collected more data and saw that by applying a combination of signal processing, clustering, and then classification techniques, he could start to infer what was appliances were being used in the customer's home. He's really the kind of godfather of a technology which has now inspired countless startups um, and energy companies like us that are looking to use it to help customers. So what is energy segregation? I promised that I would define it. It's the problem of taking the energy signal for the total load in a building, for us typically a customer's home, and breaking it down into the component parts. Um, in academia, just if you're interested to like Google it, it's often called NELM, which stands for Non-Intrusive Load Monitoring, or NIAM, Non-Intrusive Appliance Load Monitoring. We just call it disaggregation for short. It's an inference problem because you're taking a complex signal and breaking it down into what you think the component parts were. It's called non-intrusive load monitoring because another way to solve the problem could be to like, you know, give you 20 smart plugs and intrusively infer, not even infer, intrusively measure the energy use of, it, of each appliance. But that would be expensive. And then the typical input data will be something like half-hourly energy readings from a smart meter, like some of you have got in your homes. Um, or with additional hardware, much more granular readings. So perhaps you're taking a reading of the power every 10 seconds. A lot can happen in half an hour at home, right? You're cooking your meal, putting your pasta on, putting the oven on, turning the lights on and off, unplugging your phone. So a lot more can be inferred when you have the more granular data than the half hourly data. And naturally, I think a lot of the examples I'll give will relate to what you can do when you have the more granular data. But I'll try and call out for you what the differences are. For some classes of appliance, actually, even 10-second data wouldn't be enough to really distinguish them. Um, and so much higher frequency data with much more expensive sensors can be deployed in the home. And of course, you can always ask customers what's happening. Another form of input data. So moving on then to the more general building AI products, a brief definition, again, what do we mean by AI? Depending on whether you come from the business technology or maths, you might have a slightly different answer to that question. Um, and that might mean that you have different trade-offs. So the AI models that you build can be more or less capable of actually capturing the complexity in the data you have. They can be more or less challenging to run with regards to the, you know, the machinery that you need and your ability to interpret them. And then they can also be more or less hard to integrate with uncertainty. Yeah, the deep neural networks is just a funny one. I mean, that's an example of something that's very, very good at capturing very complex relationships, but rather hard to understand. Um, and then in turn, machine learning products can, and, and when I think machine learning products, for example, I'm thinking of the energy disaggregation problem. So a product that you build for a customer to help them understand their energy usage can more or less infer what it's learned from your data to the customer, or it can inform them directly and say, this is what we've seen, depending on its accuracy. It can more or less try and detect information rather than ask it, and they can more or less recommend or control. So there's a number of trade-offs that with the technology, given that it's imperfect, you have to manage when you're building the product. So for disaggregation, because I promised a little bit of technical content, the kind of models that we've used since 1992 and up to today to try and solve this still unsolved problem. Edge detection, clustering, classification, that's the one I mentioned to you from 1992 from George Hart. That's quite a nice one. It's quite physically intuitive. You can get an understanding of like how an oven behaves, the thermostatic control, you can start to understand the physical characteristics of something like a washing machine and the noise as the drum spins. Um, but it doesn't necessarily scale well. There's actually a lot of combinatorics when you're trying to match 
what happens when the appliance turns on and off, like what signal came from one appliance versus another. Um, of course, there's always purely rules-based methods. One of the ways that customers very quickly engage with their energy usage is to look at their minimum load, their standby load. And when you get the smart meter, you might have run around the house turning everything off and tried to see how low you can go. So those kind of analytics, you can, um, sorry, so with that kind of problem, you can use some quite simple rules-based analytics to work out what's the minimum load in the home. And that's a really um, nice way to kind of introduce the problem of energy savings to customers. Elsewhere in the field, I'm not the expert on this, um, factorial hidden Markov models have been used to model the load. Um, and they've been pretty quick to start and train, but it tended to only work when you had a finite number of loads. Um, and then in 2016, the startup that I worked at, before I worked at OVO, actually commercialised using deep learning for it. We found that that was much more powerful than any of the previous methods, um, but obviously it's less explainable and needed an awful lot of data. So John's talk about using a tool to generate data was very relevant because we had to generate a lot of data, you know, synthetic households to actually train our model. <coughs> and then in terms of actually evaluating these different models and seeing if they're effective for the problem we're trying to solve, I, I think uh, Paul Harper's talk was it earlier that talked about translating accuracy metrics into outcomes is really kind of relevant here. The outcome for the customer might be something like energy savings. Whereas when you're comparing different disaggregation models for the problem, what you're looking at is the accuracy of inferring which appliance was on and when. And so, as these countless startups that have all looked to solve this problem and data science teams within utilities have all looked to solve this problem, there's actually been a bit of a lack of agreement on what metric to use over which time horizon we're defining the problem of accuracy. So is it important to understand that at 4.05 a.m. a kettle was boiled, or is it important to understand the monthly spend on heating? Um, and all of these things depend on what decisions are going to be made, and also what level of accuracy will be tolerated. As an energy supplier, you really don't want to misinform your customers. So we want to keep false positive rates really low. And so if we do have a kind of probabilistic outcome for any of our models, that's really valuable. Because if we're directly wanting to inform our customers about what we've seen in their home, then we want to ensure that um, the precision is really high, but perhaps we can have the recall low because we just, you know, we won't contact every customer. Have I got that one the right way around? Yes. And then on the other hand, if we had an offer that we wanted to give a customer because we thought, for example, yeah, I'll go back to electric vehicles. If we thought, for example, they might have an electric vehicle and we wanted them to be able to benefit from one of our specialist tariffs that gives them access to a charging network, then we might be able to say, you might like to look at this tariff, but the risk of false positives isn't really there because of the way we've worded it. And so then we go for a different trade-off. Again, I'm kind of hoping that this kind of translation of, say, yeah, probabilistic outcomes to um, actual business outcomes is something that you yourselves have come across as well. Probably, actually, the most important section is the ethics of this energy usage in customers' homes. And as I told you at the beginning, like, I'm interested in utilities and water and energy because it relates so deeply to kind of human behaviour and I'm interested in people. But there's got to be a question where that's, there's an ethical concern here. Um, and certainly as an energy supplier, that's something we you know, really care about. And then there's also a really large component of behavioural impact that we have to take into account. Again, I feel like I'm echoing Paul Harper's talk from earlier, but he was talking about the rational way in which people make decisions and how that might impact the analysis that you take forward. So, these come from about the last 10 years. Um, and they all relate to different aspects of ethics or behaviour, but they're all interrelated, and I'll, I'll try and explain why. I referenced earlier that, you know, OVO believe that you know, every home should be smart metered because it supports our wider strategy of solving the demand problem with an intelligent grid with distributed storage assets. So we need smart meters everywhere. But we also know that customers won't just, you know, I mean, it's a pain, isn't it, to wait at home, get a smart meter installed. Why do you necessarily need it if you're happy being billed on estimates? So we need to offer customers propositions which make them want to have a smart meter and value it 
and give up their time to get it installed. Possibly even give up that element of privacy if they do have a concern and need to overcome some of the kind of more negative news articles about the possible risks. And I should say here, like security and consent is absolutely key in everything we're doing. Like we're not doing any analysis unless a customer has opted in to us using the data for that purpose. Um, but even so, I think it makes the challenge of productizing perhaps even harder because you've got to make sure the proposition overcomes some of the um, natural scepticisms that people have. And then there's hype. How many of you have, have got the problem of trying to explain to perhaps a senior stakeholder that the algorithm you're working on is not the holy grail? It's not the panacea that will solve all possible issues. This energy disaggregation has been hugely hyped. There was a, a one paper that in one home showed that with one kind of sensor you could see what TV channel people were watching. Only the TV was even being monitored and it was extremely granular data. They also knew what possible programs there were, and it was only four TV shows. And it was only done once. And they had all the past data of that home, including their channel watching habits. And as someone that worked for a startup, going to utilities and trying to sell a product based on this to them, they were all hugely concerned about what they read about, can't it tell what TV show I'm watching? Like, no, that's hype. So. And then on the other hand, there's a really positive side because studies have shown that real-time energy usage feedback really could contribute to energy savings. Energy savings will bring down carbon emissions, which will in turn help to tackle climate change. And then the last thing I'd call out is this work by Lynn Bartram and Stephen McConan from Canada, the University of British Columbia, who have worked on energy conservation much more from the human angle. I've been really quite inspired by it, actually. There's a YouTube talk by Lynn. And that talks about really more actively engaging the customer. They've done some experiments you know, in the problem of energy conservation. Um, I'll just finish by saying what we've done at OVO, perhaps, to round it off for you. So where we are now is very much still product testing, I would say, with customers. Like, it's, a, it's actually a joy to be somewhere where we can take some products to customers. We can give them, for example, a breakdown of their monthly energy spend and get their feedback on it. And so we're working very iteratively to understand what people value and what they don't. Um, because we only have half hourly data from smart meters, the vast majority of our methods start out being kind of more rules based, more heuristic while we're testing. And then we can in turn improve as we gather more data and start to bring in more machine learning. But overall, our approach is very iterative and really based on kind of customer feedback. And in terms of what we're optimizing for at the moment is customer engagement with the future. In future, we'll be able to measure energy savings and start to quote that as well. And again, there'll be a lovely virtuous circle of this much energy saved by our product. And we're hoping that more people will adopt it. But just as now, I'm still kind of midway through that long experiment. Started in 1992 and still ongoing. That's all.